Good morning, and welcome to High Quality Equitable Early Childhood Assessments, What's Next for California. My name is Kathy Yoon, and I'm a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute, where I work with others on research and policy issues related to early childhood, as well as educator preparation. Before LPI, I was an associate professor and department chair at Fresno State, where I was on the early childhood and teacher prep faculty. And I see some of my former colleagues and friends are here, and it's great to see everyone who's joined us today. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our partners, the Association of California School Administrators and the California County Superintendents Educational Services Association for their support with this webinar, as well as LPI's communications team. I'm just gonna start with some housekeeping and reminders. Everyone except presenters have been muted, so we'll be taking questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can write your, in your questions at any time throughout today's presentation. Today's webinar is being broadcast through your telephone or computer speakers, so please make sure you have your speakers turned on and up. If you have any technical difficulties, please call this number on the screen, select option two, and enter today's webinar ID. I'd also like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded. A video recording will be emailed to you in a few days and the slides are currently available at the link in the chat box. So today's webinar will include opening remarks by AXA's Edgar Sasueta, followed by a research presentation and a moderated panel discussion. We'll have some time for Q&A and then we'll close. We hope that your major takeaways today will include the characteristics of high quality early childhood assessment, ways in which data can inform instruction and help strengthen systems, and ways that districts and counties can support implementation. Now I'd like to invite Edgar Sasueta to provide some opening remarks. Edgar joined AXA in 2015 and currently serves as the Senior Director of Policy and Government Relations. In this role, he oversees the advocacy efforts in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. on behalf of the largest umbrella administrator organization in the United States. Thanks for joining us, Edgar. Good morning, Kathy, and thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction. It's always fun getting on these webinars and seeing the numbers grow as we jump on. So it looks like we have a, a nice crowd today. So thank you for everybody for joining us. Uh, it goes without saying that this is a super important topic and uh, at the Association of California School Administrators, we're so happy uh, to partner with LPI and our partners at Successa, uh, really a timely topic given everything that we're talking about and what's going to come online in, in, in the coming years. I think at the heart of it, our, our educators, our school leaders, our teachers, folks at the school site have really bought in to the research and the, 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 the one statistic that always sticks out is that the studies that show that about 90% of brain development happens before kindergarten. And I think that is important for everybody that's working down the pipeline as gonna serve students at any point in their educational endeavor. This is something that's really resonated and, and really forced us to focus our efforts on what can we do to really help students at those early stages. Um, the topic today uh, in terms of child assessment is even more important as we start to think about how we're gonna roll out transitional kindergarten and making sure we get this right. Uh, obviously there's some case studies out there. There's some folks who have been at the forefront, but we're now trying to think about bringing this to scale, making sure that we kind of learn from those best lessons. Um, I think another thing that educators, whether it be school site leaders, teachers are really bought into that at the end of the day, the assessments, whatever we develop, need to be able to inform uh instruction that they need to be able to be utilized to help students day in day out in the classroom and i think that's at the focus of what we're going to talk about today and why this work um, becomes so important i think I, from a personal note i worked at la unified when we were at the early early stages of uh early transitional kindergarten when we we're thinking about expanding it more so this is a conversation that's obviously been around for some years and it's exciting to see where we're at now as, as a system to at least see, have the opportunity to have to think about this uh, at a grander scale. 
I was also fortunate enough to join a group of educators and representatives from our broader education community that learn from other lessons on other states on how they're doing assessment, how they're utilizing data. I see uh, that we have some of the panelists today coming from other states. I think it's always exciting to think about some of those lessons, even from outside of our state. Um, we need to make sure, as, as stated, that whatever assessments we, we come up with, that we also learn some of the lessons from the past with other high stakes assessments, that we make sure that we're sensitive to some of the cultural and diverse needs of some of our students, and make sure we don't have any unintended consequences as we move down the pathway of how we're going to assess students. And I'd also be remiss, and I, you know, it's actually good to be on a webinar that we're not talking about COVID, uh, but I also would be remiss to not at least acknowledge that the system has a big strain right now. Uh, you can't talk to education folks without talking about the human capital challenges that we're having. And given that we're thinking about uh, rolling out transitioning to, uh, transitional kindergarten, I mean, some of the conservative estimates is that we're going to need 10,000 to 12,000 new teachers, not to mention uh, countless teacher assistants, uh, some uh, expect up to 16,000. So this is another human capital issue that we need to think about as we're thinking about the rollout. So all that to say, AXA is super excited uh, uh, to be partnering today. We appreciate all the work that LPA does as it, when it comes to teacher retention. And I think they're uh, a natural partner here as we start thinking about assessment. Uh, so thank you for everybody's uh, participation. We look forward to today's discussion. Thank you so much, Edgar. I bet your remarks really hit home for a lot of folks. Uh, we're really excited to share our report on high quality early childhood assessments with you all today. And I'd like to start with acknowledging my co-authors, Hannah Melnick and Marjorie Wexler. So the purpose of our report was to synthesize what we know in the field about high quality early childhood assessment and to provide some examples of how different states and districts have gone about choosing, implementing, and using early childhood assessments. And in the report, we honed in on kindergarten entry assessments because they are becoming quite common. But the research and findings in the report are really applicable across all early childhood assessments. So we reviewed the literature, did a 50 state scan, and conducted interviews, and we looked across multiple states and districts to help us answer some questions. Like, what types of assessments are states and districts using? What might administrators look for in a high quality assessment? What training and supports are needed? How are states and districts supporting continuous improvement? And what strategies and cautions can we learn from their experiences? But right now, we'd like to know from you, and we're gonna put up a poll for you all, what assessments does your school, district, or county use in TK and K, in transitional kindergarten and kindergarten? And you can select all that apply in your context. And for some of you, you can select not applicable. I see we have a lot of um, preschool educators and directors, some university faculty today, and even some students in the audience. Um, so I, yeah, I see, the, I see the responses coming in. We'll just give it another few seconds here. Um, yeah, if you if you choose other, um, it would be great if you could um, describe or name your assessment in the chat box. Um, and I, I see I see some responses coming into the chat already. Um, I'll just give it maybe one more second. All right, let's take a look at those results. Okay, so it looks like uh, a lot of you are using DRDP currently. Um, some of you are using the ASQ, Ages and Stages. Um, a few of you are using other um, assessments, the Brigantz, uh, the DRA. Um, a few of you are using the KSEP. Um, yeah, and then in the chat, I see um, 
there's a, a really a, a broad range of assessments that people are using, Dibbles, Fountas and Pinnell, um, district, district developed um, assessments. Um, so yeah, so lots of vari variability um, in the assessments that we're, uh, you're currently using. So keep those current assessments in mind because now I'm gonna share with you what the existing body of research says about what a high quality early childhood assessment looks like. And as I'm sharing, I encourage you to think about how many of these characteristics your current assessments have. Now I'm gonna go through the main points really quickly, but we lay out the details and citations in the report. So you can look back over them when you have time and that link is in the chat. And remember, you'll also have access to today's slides. So when we looked at the existing research on early childhood assessments, we saw three major themes related to the components of quality. So the first component when you're looking at assessment quality is content. And when it comes to content, high quality early childhood assessments include the essential domains, social emotional, cognitive, language and literacy, mathematical and scientific reasoning and physical development. They also place children's skills along a continuum or progression so that teachers can see developmentally where children's skills fall. High quality assessments align to standards and curriculum, but only if those standards are developmentally appropriate. And they should be part of ongoing formative assessment throughout the year across preschool to third grade. Content should be inclusive of all children, regardless of background and early experiences. And the content needs to be relevant and sufficiently detailed to inform instruction, which is really a key purpose for assessment. The second component of high quality assessments is that they have administration procedures that are fair for all children and practical for teachers. So procedures should be appropriate for young children and assessment should take place in a natural and familiar setting. So take observation, for example, where children, teachers are documenting children's interactions during regular daily activities or performance tasks. For example, asking a child to respond to a prompt, like, you know, can you write your name? And they shouldn't require children to sit still and focus for long periods of time, because we know that that's not developmentally appropriate. And that includes, you know, being on the computer. High quality assessments accommodate a range of abilities, languages, and cultures in how it's administered, including allowing children to demonstrate what they know in different ways. And in order to do this, teachers need adequate professional development, including professional development that addresses bias. And we had several people submit questions about teacher subjectivity in observations. Professional development, practice, and coaching with specific attention to addressing bias are critical for any kind of assessment. And teachers also need the resources to help them implement and use the assessment effectively to inform their instruction. The third component is validity. High quality assessments yield results that are authentic and accurate and valid for all the children being assessed including children with a range of linguistic and cultural backgrounds and abilities. And because assessment data are only really valid when used for what they were designed, they need to be aligned with the intended purposes for the data. So I'm gonna give you two examples of assessment tools that look different, but both have many of the high quality characteristics that we just went over. In Illinois, they use the Kindergarten Individual Development Survey or KIDS which is an observation tool and it's based on developmental progressions. So it's appropriate to use with children with lots of different backgrounds and abilities and especially for dual language learners because the observations aren't dependent on a specific language. Kids is short, it has 14 items, but it includes the multiple domains. And you can see here in this photo, a teacher uh, in Illinois using an iPad to collect documentation while observing and interacting with children in the Dramatic Play Center. Districts in Georgia use a state developed tool in kindergarten called the Georgia Kindergarten Inventory of Developing Skills or GKIDS that starts at the beginning of the year with 20 items also across multiple domains. 
These 20 items are a combination of teacher observation items and performance-based direct assessment items. So it includes, for example, an observation item that looks at children's ability to follow multi-step directions, as well as direct assessment, performance tests where children are counting items or sorting shapes. And then that initial assessment is tied to a year-long assessment that teachers use formatively throughout the kinder year. And GKids uses a universal design for learning framework to help make it accessible to children with varying abilities and experiences. So that was a lot of information. Again, you can refer back to the report for more detail. Um, but now that we've gone over what a high quality assessment looks like, let's look at ways that states and districts use them for informing instruction and for other purposes. So based on our background research and 50 state scan, we selected eight states and two districts that use assessments that demonstrate many of those high quality characteristics that we just went over and have been implementing their assessments for at least a few years. And we looked across those states and districts to examine how are they using their assessments and data. And we also were, were looking for commonalities that we could learn from. Because assessment shouldn't just be a compliance exercise, right? If, if teachers are spending time administering assessments, that data and information should be used in productive and intentional ways. And we found three main elements of intentional implementation of early childhood assessments. The first element of intentional early childhood assessment implement, implementation is using it to inform and improve instruction. So informing and improving instruction is a primary purpose of early childhood assessment. And we found that some places like Illinois are going beyond that to using their assessments to drive pedagogical change, to help shift teaching practices in kindergarten to be more developmentally appropriate, more play-based, and really using the observational nature of the assessment to drive improved practice. And we'll hear from our panelists about what that looks like at a district level. But across the different states and districts that we looked at, there were some things that supported the use of assessments for informing and improving instruction. And the first thing is adequate professional development. In the places we studied, this was critical to implementing an assessment well. And that professional development needs to be ongoing. A point in time training is not enough for teachers to develop expertise with an assessment tool. They need ongoing PD and coaching, and not just teachers, but also site leaders, principals, and district leaders. And in a little bit, we'll talk with our panelists, Jennifer and Katie, about the different, about the kinds of professional development that they provide in their districts. Something else that stakeholders talked about was the need for timely access to data. Teachers need a user-friendly way to access data when they need it. Um, one state administrator that we interviewed said that a bad data portal for teachers can actually make or break an assessment. And adequate time and resources. Teachers need things like release time, planning time, instructional aids, and other supports to assist them with documenting evidence, entering data, and preparing reports. The second element of intentional early childhood assessment implementation is using it to strengthen early learning systems. We found in the places that we studied that good use of assessments can help make early childhood systems stronger. And there are several ways to do that. In the two districts represented on our panel today, they use their assessments to help promote alignment in P3. For example, in Elgin U46, the district aligned their kindergarten assessment both down into pre-K and up into first grade. So they shifted to using an aligned assessment tool in pre-K. And then to align up from kinder, the district extended professional development to first grade teachers so that they were learning alongside their kindergarten colleagues. And the first grade teachers who participated actually ended up modifying their instruction. And in Tulare City, they used the same assessment tool in pre-K with their threes and fours and in transitional kindergarten and kindergarten. And they've also aligned that assessment to anchor standards in grades one and two, so that teachers could really see the standards as a developmental continuum where each year builds on the previous. High quality assessments can also be used to engage families as partners in children's development. 
So for example, Elgin and other districts in Illinois use their kindergarten assessment measures as their report card. And in Washington state, their kindergarten assessment process actually includes a formal family connection component. Data can also be aggregated to provide indicators of system level needs. We saw some communities are using their data to launch and inform community level initiatives, like in Elgin, and Katie can speak more to this later during the panel discussion, but they used assessment data to fuel initiatives like the one you see here, where they created park signage to encourage families to engage in activities that promote development. And later, we'll also hear from Francine about how First Five Monterey County uses aggregated data to inform work at the county level. But there need to be guardrails against misuses of assessments and data. So for example, they shouldn't be used to delay kindergarten entrance because, and we'll probably hear Francine say this again later, but it's not children who need to be ready for kindergarten, but schools need to be ready to meet children where they are. It's also inappropriate to evaluate individual teachers or programs because children's development is affected by a multitude of factors that teachers, programs, and schools can't control, like nutrition, healthcare, and housing. And also because using data for high stakes purposes threatens the reliability and validity of data, and it incentivizes programs to inflate scores. So we really need to be careful about how we use the data and think about those potential pitfalls ahead of time. Finally, the third element of intentional assessment implementation is to provide supports and create conditions to help make success as likely as possible. First, all the places we studied involved robust stakeholder engagement at every phase along the way, including teachers, union reps, parents. We found this to be really important for generating buy-in and getting teachers on board. Strategic communication. It's critical to get all stakeholders on the same page about what the assessment is and isn't, what the data means or doesn't. And I think during the panel, just, uh, Jennifer is going to touch on the importance of clear and consistent messaging. All the systems we looked at started out with a gradual approach. Many pilot assessments were two to five years, and then they continued to engage in ongoing evaluation of their assessments through implementation studies or collecting regular feedback from teachers. And in fact, Katie was just recently telling me about her work with a task force of pre-K, K and first grade teachers in Elgin. And she can tell us a little bit more about that later. And finally, all of this requires ongoing administrative and financial support. So just to recap, high quality early childhood assessments have appropriate content, administration procedures, and validity for children with diverse abilities, special needs, cultural backgrounds, and home languages. Using assessment data to inform and improve instruction requires professional development, access to data, and resources. Aggregated um, assessment data can be used to strengthen early learning systems, but we need guardrails against misuse. And finally, assessment implementation and continuous improvement require robust stakeholder engagement and ongoing resources. So that was a ton of information in a really short time. Please reach out to, um, to me, if, to us, if you have any questions, uh, we'll put my email in the chat. And everything we talked about and a lot more is in our report, so you can reference that for more details. And there's even a brief if you want a shorter read. But now we're going to transition to the amazing panel that we have lined up for today to hear from their experience what this all actually looks like in real life. And I'll start by introducing today's moderator, Sarah Neville Morgan. Sarah is a Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction for the Opportunities for All Branch, or OFAB, at the California Department of Education and oversees a nearly $10 billion budget and five divisions early education, expanded learning, multilingual support, nutrition services, and special education. Under Sarah's leadership, OFAB helps all of California's 6.2 million students from cradle to career have access to quality preschool and after-school programs, 
adequate access to nutritious meals and quality inclusive public education that enhances their well-being, supports multilingual language development and improves their educational potential. Sarah, welcome and I'll pass it to you to kick off our panel discussion and introduce our panelists. Thanks so much, Kathy. I wanna thank LPI for this really timely and critical conversation. And I always wanna give a quick shout out to my team for the work they do to support children, families, schools, and programs, including the use of assessments um, such as DRDP in our state preschool programs. So in setting the context, there's a why assessments and why now question. Along with the rest of the nation, California is in the midst of unprecedented change. Edgar highlighted some of these in his welcome. In the wake of the pandemic, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a historic budget with sweeping investments in education from cradle to career that provide an opportunity to transform California's educational landscape. There are a few critical investments that make this webinar and the related assessments report from LPI and its recommendations particularly timely. So the first is the expansion of universal preschool in California. The budget provides phase in over five years to move our local education agencies from serving older four-year-old children to all four-year-olds by 2025-26, with this first year as a planning year. This means that California could serve as many as 345,000 more children in transitional kindergarten than the approximately 90,000 we currently serve. Our budget also expanded our state preschool program so we can serve even more of those unserved children, especially our three-year-olds in high quality preschool. The second is the updates to the preschool learning foundations are California standards for what preschool age children need to know and be supported to be able to do, and some corresponding resources and assessment tools. This will be accomplished by incorporating recent research in the field, including best practices to support our multilingual learners and inclusion of children with disabilities, oops, and there goes my lights, and more explicitly address cultural and linguistic responsivity, as well as anti-bias and anti-racist practices in the, the standards. It also has to develop curriculum and educator resources to implement those standards and adapt the desired results developmental profile or DRDP to reflect those updated standards. It addresses preschool to second grade, so we get the continuum, and includes direct assessment of literacy and math. At the same time, the California Department of Education has launched a P3 initiative in recognition of the science that demonstrates quality early learning experiences can have meaningful and lasting impacts, impacts on child outcomes, but these are best supported and sustained if early elementary instructional practices are designed to build upon children's, children's early developmental gains. The convergence of these activities and these investments creates a unique opportunity to support whole child development across those early years from birth to age eight. We want all educators to support and utilize observational and direct assessments to understand each child's progress in a range of domains, such as literacy, language, math, social, emotional, and executive functioning development, and intentionally design learning opportunities to support this growth. Pulling directly from LPI's High Quality Early Child Assessment Report, in it they say, a state's choice of assessment is critical what is measured and how it is measured can drive the way children are taught and how their needs are understood. So really to achieve this use of assessment means that we need to support transfer of assessment data from preschool into early grades. We also know assessments alone won't create the learning opportunities we want to see. The explicit linkage of assessments to curriculum, as well as changes to our teacher preparation and professional development systems will be critical to ensuring the use of assessments translate into the outcomes we know are possible for children. I'd now like to introduce and welcome our group of esteemed panelists who lead this work on the ground in their communities so we can hear firsthand from them what they've been doing to ensure this work happens in a developmentally informed way. So I think I get to start with um, Francine Rod, who is someone I have known 
dearly for quite a few years. She's been the executive director for First Five Monterey County since January 2004, where she leads the organization in supporting children from the prenatal stage through age five and their families. Whether in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, or California, her career has focused on supporting communities that have been furthest from opportunity to advocate for changes in inequitable systems and to strengthen community members' capacity for self-determination and social change. Francine really leads equity in action. Next, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Maraquin. She has worked in the field of early childhood education for approximately 15 years. In addition to having served as an elementary school teacher, as her district's early childhood education director, she works to bridge the gap between preschool and transitional kindergarten and kindergarten through implementing a developmental approach to learning, developmentally appropriate aligned assessments and quality staff development. The work her district is doing in relation to P3 alignment has been sought out by district officials and research agencies throughout the state of California. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Katie Cox. She has worked for over 20 years in early childhood education and administration. Katie began her career working in rural community development in Arizona near the Mexico border. From that experience, she learned the value of moving communities through increasing early learning outcomes for children. She is currently the Director of Early Learning Initiatives in School Districts U46 in Elgin, Illinois, which is a diverse suburb in Northwest Chicago. So welcome all. We're gonna move into some questions of the panelists. And I'm gonna start with one that is directed really for Jennifer and Katie. So as we look at the individual child level data, it's especially crucial now with COVID-19. What are some of the benefits of using an observational assessment tool? Well, good morning. Um, I'm excited to be here and get to share what our district is currently doing. Um, Tulare City School District is using the DRDP and we use that in preschool, TK and kindergarten. And one of the benefits that we have seen, we've actually seen a lot of benefits to using a developmentally appropriate assessment tool. And we've been using it for approximately six years now in all of these different um, grade levels. But one of the main things is that we see that the developmental profile helps us to focus on the whole child. We know that with our littlest learners, um, they are well more than just English language arts and math. And so an assessment tool that focuses on the social emotional, especially since Sarah talked about with COVID and the impacts that it has, we have really embraced what um, the DRDP has offered for us as far as looking at that social emotional component. Another um, positive trait that we've seen is that it is an assessment that's conducted over time. So it's just not a one and done assessment. As we know, we as adults are continually learning and through our experiences and our students' experiences, they're continually learning as well. So looking at an assessment that is conducted over time is also beneficial. Um, we had mentioned earlier, Kathy had mentioned in her, um, her research in that the natural setting is so valuable, especially for our youngest learners. Um, I can think of examples of, I can see kids counting bananas in the dramatic play station. I know then at that point that that child has a number sense. They have a grasp on number sense if they can one-to-one -one count that those bananas. So being able to use that as an assessment tool and um, use that to guide our instruction is also important. With our tool and the way we use it in our district is it's an all hands on deck. So it does not just fall solely on the teacher. And so with this and the observations, we incorporate our administration to collect evidence and take notes, our curriculum coaches, we train instructional aides. So, um, you know, we just look at that whole entire picture with our, um, with our district. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Katie, do you wanna share a little bit about yours? Sure, we also use the DRDP for preschool and then the kids assessment, which is aligned to DRDP and it's Illinois' 
um, version, they took out some measures and prioritized them. And so all of our kindergarten students are rated on that actually three times a year. Um, what we have seen here in our program is the greatest part of it is similar to what Jennifer said, is it's really happens in their natural environment over time. It's not a one point in time assessment. There's no anxiety and you're really able to get a feel for what the kids are actually capable of doing. Um, the teachers have the freedom to observe. Our, we don't have quite a robust amount of people doing the observations. It's mostly classroom staff, um, but boy, would they love if I suggested that administrators help out with that. That would be popular, <laughs> I could see. So. Um, we, they can, you know, take observations of the kids outside. I can think of an example. They were doing a science prediction um, unit with wind and the teacher had brought out onto the playground um, some scarves and asked the kids what they thought would happen when she let go of, and then everybody made a prediction about what was going to happen. She wrote down everybody's predictions. They let the scarves go and then um, process the activity. So, um, you know, there's just so many opportunities, you know, during the day to find out, you know, where the kids are at with their thinking, problem solving, um, and achievement. Um, another example that I had thought of when um, Jennifer was speaking was we had a conversation with, around um, kind of read aloud comprehension for kids, for the students in this particular class. And the, I asked the teacher, have you ever, the comprehension was really low. And she said, you know, I don't think that's true for my kids. I, I, I feel like they could do better. And I said, have you ever, um, you know, done the read aloud in a small group setting? You know, we have small groups as part of the day. And She's like, I had it. I always do the read aloud with everyone, you know, and she's like, because that's part of my favorite part of the day. And I'm like, well, we might want to experiment and try with that. And she did. And what she got out of the kids um, and their questioning and conversation and dialogue from that was so much richer and had so much more depth. Um, so I think that, you know, the conversations that can come out of the assessment data are unbelievable. And you're just able to see so much more about what the kids are capable of. Thanks so much, Katie. What you gave to me was a, a great visual. And one of the things I think we've all missed with COVID-19 is being able to, to be with the children. And so that visual really helped me picture what's happening in the programs and in the classrooms. So appreciate that. Jennifer, I wanted to give you the opportunity to go a little bit deeper on how do observational assessments like the DRDP support developmentally appropriate instruction. You talked a little bit about that when um, a few minutes ago, but I wanted to know if there was anything you wanted to share more in that space. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I think that it has worked for our district and for our teachers is that the DRDP, and to clarify, I've seen a question, in kindergarten, we use the DRDPK. So that is the assessment tool that we use. Um, it serves as an instructional map for teachers. It allows them to see, it's that million dollar question, what does developmentally appropriate instruction look like? And so this assessment tool has helped teachers grasp what does it look like at the various different levels? So they know how to differentiate instruction, but also how to help each child where they're at and then make targeted goals and plans to help them be successful to achieve those next levels. And so that is kind of where we have really seen is that not only is it a wonderful assessment tool for students, but it's also a wonderful teaching tool for teachers. And so to bridge those together, um, you know, just really makes that alignment piece so much more effective because what we are working on in preschool, we can align then with the DRDP for us in our district is it completely overlaps. So where one grade level ends, a teacher can pick up and begin working on follow-up skills in the next grade level. So we're not having to start from square one each time a child enters into a new grade level. So that's kind of where we have seen the benefits to helping us with that developmentally appropriate instruction. Thanks so much, Jennifer. That's so critical when we talk about initiatives like P3 and ensuring that continuum and the alignment is both in the practices and the assessments and also in that teacher professional learning, um, that community that you create around that space. I'm gonna move us into some district level or systems level questions. And I'm gonna um, ask both Katie and Francine to address some of these. So starting again with Katie, how do a 
observational assessment data, how does that really inform your district level decisions? Sure. Um, I'm relatively new to this role here in U46, um, but I can explain a little bit about what I know historically they've used the data for and then what I'm really focusing on it with, and that is community systems work. So we have about, um, well, let me rewind. First of all, I should share that, and I forget you're not all from the state of Illinois. So um, in the state of Illinois, we are all required across the entire state to give um, the kids assessment the first 40 days um, after children have been in kindergarten. And so the exciting piece of that is the, is the accountability piece because it draws attention in our state and into our communities about how we are preparing our children for school um, and how, like kind of what, how we use that data to help us create programs and curriculum and make educational decisions about how to meet the kids' needs. Um, and so I can't tell you, I think it was a year ago that Illinois put on our district report cards that are created by the State Board of Education and publicly available on our websites, um, the percentage of kids in kindergarten that are participating in that assessment. Um, and by measuring that, Whatever we measure as a system is where the value is placed. And so while traditionally, you know, our, you know, our high school ACT and SAT scores have been on there, our freshmen on track, all secondary measures of our success have been on those report cards. And for the first time, our kindergarten readiness um, is on there. And so that was a huge step in our state. And I would strongly hope that your state might consider something similar. Um, but it also helps the focus of how do we work and partner with our community organizations that are serving our early learners? Because in our district, while we have about 1,500 kids um, in our preschool program, we have 2,500 in a given year in our kindergarten program. So we're missing about 1,000 kids every year. They're still here in our community. So my work as the director and in with our community organizations is to help support how can we increase their readiness or how can we, you know, maximize their development. So it's a lot. It helps us a lot um, with our communication and partnership with them. Um, let me see. I think that um, another piece that prior to this kindergarten assessment, we were measuring our kids. Um, kindergarten and readiness in their achievement in kindergarten all around letter identification. It was a strategic goal that the school board had. Um, our teachers are still, it's like still measured on this. It's like the thorn in my side um, because as I said, what gets measured gets accomplished so we can get kids that are five years old to know their letters. But is that really indicative of their literacy success later in their educational career? And it's not. And we have a, a district here that is running some action research on their students. They're about five years in and they've been looking at their measures um, on their kids assessment to figure out which ones are showing the greatest growth in their on their students' MAP scores, their NWEA scores in third grade. Um, and what they found is that reciprocal conversation is the greatest indicator of their success in literacy later on. Not letter identification. So I think this is really critical. This information and these assessments really can show where we need to put our focus. And so I think there's just a lot of, um, it's an exciting time to be in early childhood, I think, and using this data to inform not just what's happening in the classroom, which is really important, but also like, what are we doing as a system to promote our children's growth and development? Thank you so much for that, Katie. So even though you're not in California, there's a lot that California can learn from other states who have gone out in front of us in some of these practices or doing parallel pieces. And I will also shout out that Illinois has some great bilingual program models for their preschool program. So a lot happening there for us to definitely pay attention to. And that research that you just cited will come in really handy as we drop back into our preschool learning foundations and DRDP and what pieces of literacy really do matter as we move forward. So I'm gonna move over to Francine 
and ask you, Francine, why is aggregated child level data from a common measure important at the county level? In what ways have you used DRDP child level data to inform your work at First Five Monterey in Monterey County and, um, and bubbling that back up to people like me where you send emails to let me know what's going on? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So um, similar to what Katie was saying, we have actually used the data to support understanding more and better what is needed in the county. So for example, we have disaggregated the data by region, by ethnicity, um, by school performance and looked and shared that information with stakeholders and it's really catalyzed them towards action. One of our commissioners has said, everyone can rally and unify around a data story and especially one where we're all in this together. Uh, we really emphasize the no finger pointing and that it's a common goal for unifying and improving the system of support for our children and our families, our teachers and our administrators. So some of the districts, for example, when we've provided them with the, the data, um, have used it to look at vertical articulation uh, and to see how the articulation has gone from preschool to TK to kinder uh, now through um, P3. And they have seen there's been some real mental model shifts um, all through that articulation in terms of the teachers understanding the root causes or the situations that the children are in because our assessment includes not only the child assessment, but we look at a teacher survey and a family survey to get a whole picture of what the system is like for our children and our families when they're coming into it. We also, when TK first started, First Five Monterey County, which I know there are people on this call from different parts of the United States, and some of you may not know what First Five is, but we were funded by Tax on Tobacco Products. And it uh, First Five supports whole child, whole family approaches for children ages zero to five and their families. And so obviously early childhood development is a piece of that. And what we saw when TK started rather quickly was we believe that play, as I know you all do, is the way that young children learn. And so we wanted to make sure that there were developmentally appropriate materials and learning and approaches in the classroom to receive those children. So we provided small grants to classrooms to support the age appropriate um, materials and training to ensure that our teachers uh, were also uh, ready for play. Uh, the other thing that we did was uh, with the data uh, was to also look at a grant to the county, Monterey County Office of Education for their early learning network so that they could do a countywide uh, preschool, TK and kindergarten uh, network to look at what the needs are within the county. So those are just some of the things that we, we have used that data for. Thanks so much for that, Francine. I'm going to have you drop in a little bit more deeply because I know equity has been part of your work from the beginning. So how does that child level data really inform your county's focus on race, equity, diversity, and inclusion? So in one very concrete way, the um, school districts have been able to use the data that we've provided to them to, to do their LCAPs. Um, because that's a big piece of the um, LCAPs is to really look at what is happening with our populations that have been put at risk. Um, the child level data, when it's illuminated in the right way, and we look to ways that we're not weaponizing data and that we're also putting the onus on the system um, and on those of us who've created the system, really shows the injustices and the disparities in a way that you can no longer ignore them. So in our county, we use the acronym READI, R-E-D-I. And, um, and that is a, a way to emphasize that our children are not gonna be ready, R-E-A-D-Y, unless our systems and supports are really authentically using and centering race, equity, diversity, and inclusion of uh, both special needs and parent voice. So in addition to the child level data assessments, as I mentioned, we also include a teacher and parent survey. And we also ask ethnicities of the teachers when we're doing those surveys and paint a holistic picture of the system that's supporting our children. So there've also been some innovative recent work done by Michael Applegate of the Bright uh, Futures Education Partnership in developing school equity indicators. Um, they show, not surprisingly, that school districts with majority white students uh, spend more per pupil 
than those with majority of students of color. Um, so again, this ends up catalyzing different stakeholders to action, including parents and funders. Uh, so I think we have a link to that, the guide that um, Strive Together, and he's been very active, uh, Michael Applegate's been very active in helping to identify those indicators, can put that in the chat. And no one is advocating for those that have higher resources to get less. On the contrary, we really recognize that nobody has enough uh, resources to support our children and families. But by shining a light on those inequities, uh, we can really support those districts um, who have less. It's also about identifying the root causes. And so that actually, that data helped us to launch something called the Bright Beginnings Initiative in our county. And one of the initiative's main goals is to ensure that all children in Monterey County succeed in school and life by closing the opportunity gaps that exist and that are, are predicted by race, ethnicity, income, and zip code. Um, I think we're gonna put a link to that in the chat as well. So it's really important that future assessments take racial equity and root causes into consideration as we're moving forward with this. Thank you so much, Francine. That is so critical to really ground it in that. And I liked how you put it as shining the light and then use some of those terms that our K-12 part of our system really uses around the root causes and making sure that that LCAP is part of the process and that you're helping partner and inform them in that space. I'd like to move us now into the teacher side. We all know that quality within programs and classrooms is always dependent on that teacher. Teachers are so critical. So how do you ensure that teachers and administrators have the professional development that they need to use these assessments and data effectively? And I wanna also fold in there, how are you ensuring that everything is play-based, that you have joyful learning from the children as you move through some of this? And we're gonna start um, with Jennifer. So Jennifer, could you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. I can speak to the two different types of professional development stakeholders that we work with, um, our teachers, but also what is just as important is our administration because they are the ones that support our teachers. So it's important that everyone has a well-versed um, knowledge in the assessment tool. And so one of the things for administrators that we do in our district is that we work through uh, district learning data summits where we help administrators understand the data. For many of us, you know, that have worked in education, you know, data from first grade to eighth grade or high school is looked at readily, but no one really kind of knows what do you do with kindergarten data? What do you do with TK data? What do you do with preschool data? And so with the use of our observational assessment tool, we are able to look at the data, make selected goals, work towards it at a district level, a classroom level, and at an individualized student level. And so based on that data, Teachers can take their information and through PLCs each week, they work together and we have coaching where they're looking at the data, making informed decisions based on instruction. One thing that was discussed earlier is the need for ongoing. We cannot have the one and done because as adults, we're constantly, we learn something new each time. Oftentimes it can be overwhelming, your cup overflows, you, you're only able to take in so much. So we want to continually revisit and refollow up with our um, teachers and our administrators. And just like students, we want to make sure that the instructional um, professional development that we provide is differentiated for teachers, that we look to see what do individual teachers need to be better at their craft, to be more efficient. Um, training on calibration, I've seen that come through as well of what, how do you how do you monitor observational assessment data? It's through calibration training to ensure that we are all doing um, the same type of rating. And so that's kind of what we look at. And then the last thing I've seen a question come through about curriculum. How does the curriculum align with what is taking place? We go through at our district and we align, we take our curriculum, we take our intervention. I've seen like Dibbles is being used by some people, a cadence, 95% fluency. We take those as a district and we align it to our developmentally appropriate assessment. So if a child is performing at a certain level on this assessment, it makes it easier for teachers to rate and be able to place on the continuum because we've made that correlation for them. So we pull teachers in as part of that training process so that they are a part of it. So there is that buy-in. So that's kind of just an overarching how we are um, you know, using that professional development within our district. 
Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I think we've had such a rich discussion that I'm going to start running out of time and I want to go deeper and deeper into what everyone has said so far. So I'm going to pull a question over from the audience, actually, around what strategies work well for teachers to implement and document and respond. So knowing that assessments take time, how are we, how are you all building that in and using those ongoing observational assessments? So Katie, I know you were set up to talk a little bit around um, a, sort of a boot camp, but I also want you to be able to cover how do you support the teachers in using these in the moment or carving out time for them? Sure. Um, so in my previous role, I was a director in another district. I spent a lot of time with teachers trying to work through how they could create systems in their classrooms to stay on top of the demand of observational assessment because it is so challenging, um, especially if you're doing a full, um, you know, tool with 47 measures or however many, many measures that you have adopted. Um, so really what we did was spent time chunking when the teachers were going to focus on what measures. So kind of dividing them up across a semester or trimester and looking at how to set up um, systems in their classrooms so that they were looking at all of the development kind of on a loop, you know, like through the kids um, work and how they were setting up their classrooms. So they used a lot of checklists, um, electronic portfolios helped them a lot. I know you could see that in that one picture, one of the teachers standing there with an iPad, um, you know, there's multiple different platforms that your districts can purchase to help teachers sort. And we found out that through using technology really helped them and giving them the tools they needed just made it so much easier. Um, the teachers previously had been using paper portfolios and post-it notes, and they found that to just be overwhelming. But by spending some time and investing and really listening to them about what they need um, and getting it for them, it made a monumental um, difference. And then once things were organized for them electronically, they were able to really look at the observation and the student work that they had captured electronically and see how it actually tied to multiple measures and maybe even multiple students. Um, and so it really helped them meet the demand and a and we also looked at kind of, um, you know, what Jennifer had mentioned, having, you know, their classroom care professionals support with taking some data and having our, you know, gym teacher playground people who are interacting with the kids share on some of that responsibility. Thanks so much, Katie. Truly, this conversation has been enriching and I wish we had more time to go more deeply into it. In about 30 seconds, does, do any of you want to tackle how you ensure that through the use of assessment, we're still focused on play and joyful learning? I think the developmental assessment tool really ties into that because it was mentioned earlier, what we teach is what we assess. So if we are assessing a developmentally appropriate and looking at how we get those things then we are going to set up our classroom environments to ensure that we are meeting the needs of kids. And what we have seen is that these, our children are so young, they need these developmental, this is how they learn. They learn through play and they need to have hands-on learning. And honestly, this, is, this goes well beyond even kindergarten and TK. Our first and second and third graders, we need to do what's developmentally appropriate, you know, for the age level that we're working with. And so, you know, ensuring that our classroom environments, where we put our money to purchase the manipulatives and the toys and the tools and the things and training teachers on how to use it. I think that's where it becomes essential in ensuring that it becomes play-based. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I think that will wrap up our part of this conversation and what a better place to land on developmentally appropriate play and how that's infused throughout all of this work. I do wanna make a quick notion or note that as CDE works through our Preschool Learning Foundations process, we will over the next year actually be doing a lot of focus groups and conversations to hear both about how you're using the tool and how to make it more accessible to teachers as we look at assessments. And this conversation here really helped me think about additional pieces to make sure that the teachers are best supported 
um, and the administrators to use these tools. So Kathy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to today's presenters and um, audience um, uh, for your participation. Um, so what does this mean for you, um, for your district, um, early childhood learning setting, your, your county, your community, um, especially in the midst of a pandemic and with the expansion of transitional kindergarten? Um, we hope that you're taking away some ideas or questions that will help you think about the tools that you're using now or that you may be thinking about adopting. Um, and we want to thank uh, AXA, CSESA, and LPI again for bringing us together. Thank you for all um, who attended. And um, we'll, we'd like to mention that a survey will appear in your window um, and we'd appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much.